Well, welcome you privileged people. We're so lucky to have this intimate chance to look at our own beautiful collection with the close perspective of one of American art's most per perceptive historian curators. Tonight is the night that we're truly glad that we've started doing podcasts of our talks um, because those of our friends who are away on fancy vacations won't have to miss the whole thing. So. Um, I'm Melissa Vale. I'm a trustee of the Friends of John Jay Homestead, and on behalf of New York State Parks and the Friends, I welcome you to the second evening in our 2016 series, Telling Stories of War. Um, quick reminder, would you please turn off your cell phones, and the exits are there and there. That's my job. Um, some thank yous to the Scholars Committee, whose names are on the back of your program, for their generosity with their underwriting and their ideas. And thanks to our volunteers, thanks to our members. How many people here are members? Raise your hand if you're a member. I never know what the right answer to that is. If everyone is here, it means there's no one who I can encourage to join. But if no one is a member, it means we failed. So whatever, I'll just choose to think that it's the right answer either way. So you're our backbone, and we will use your support well. Um, and most important, especially tonight, thanks to the staffs of the state and the friends organizations. Tonight, this is the real group to thank, since they're the custodians of our collection. Um, we're sorry that the house isn't open for a tour tonight, but we really encourage everyone to come back and with another look using the eyes that Kevin Murphy is going to help us develop. Um, upcoming events. This year's theme of the Scholar Series is Telling Stories of War. Last month, we talked about how the country takes care of its soldiers now and how their experience is expressed through song. And next month on the Ides of March, we'll talk about constitutions, beginning with what many consider to be the model of a Western constitution, Magna Carta, and its companion document, the Forest Charter which may have been even more consequential and which created the rule of law for nature. Um, with Professor Nicholas Robinson, one of the real founders of the field of environmental law. So please come back for that and look at our calendar for our lineup of events starting in the spring, including gardening classes starting in March. And isn't that something nice to look forward to? Now, some of you know that I try to find a J connection in each of these evenings. Tonight, the connection has to do with the focus of this book on the period when people who lived here were deciding whether they were British or American. John Jay himself was a reluctant patriot, holding out hope for longer than many of his cohort that a reconciliation might be found, until the Declaration of Independence was signed when he was all in. Um, and another connection is how we teach our school programs and trying to get our young visitors to put themselves in the minds of people living here in the early 1800s. It certainly comes up when we talk about the chamber pot and for sure when we talk about yeah, how people were able to accept the idea of owning other people. Um, but we're also reminded of what David McCullough says about the founding period, that we really don't have any understanding of how hard it was and how dangerous and how much the revolutionaries were putting at risk in their push to independence. So that's what Kevin Murphy is going to do for us tonight, help us look at these works of art, which might seem to us now to be just handsome furnishings in a handsome house. Um, and show us where the changes were coming and where the boldness and audacity are and what they might have communicated to contemporary visitors to this house. Um, this exhibit grew out of a partnership among Crystal Bridges Museum of Art in Bentonville, Arkansas, the Terra Foundation in Chicago, the Musée du Louvre, and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. The partnership also produced two other exhibits on American and European encounters through landscape and genre painting, but it's portraiture that addresses the theme of revolution and conflict. Kevin was the lead curator for this exhibit when he was at Crystal Bridges, where he was curator of American art, and saw that museum through some of the exciting stages of its fast early growth. He's now the Eugenie Prendergast Curator of American Art at the Williams College Museum of Art. He's now working on an exhibit from their permanent collection, which I'm sure will be just as 
beautiful and interesting as this one. And so please help me welcome Kevin Murphy. Um, thanks a lot, Melissa, for inviting me. This is a real pleasure to, uh, you know, it was a lovely drive down the Taconic, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it's great to be here, and it was great to have a, a tour of the house with, um, with Heather, and I, you know, it's, it, I know a number of the, the New York State Historic Site houses are more familiar with the ones in, uh, the, on the Hudson River, um, because it's closer to Williamstown, uh, but this is a really amazing house because the family was here for so long and there's so much of it intact. I mean, so many of these houses, things had you know, left at various points in time and you, know, you don't have the real sense. I was looking at the, all of the wonderful books and thinking about how one could really do a sort of intellectual history um, from, from John all the way through successive generations of the family by looking at what they were reading and what they were collecting. Um, so this is a really, it's a, it was a, it's, it, this has been a wonderful evening so far, and uh, I hope um, that I'll, I'll live up to uh, her nice introduction. Um, as, as she said, this was an exhibition series that we were doing for, with Crystal Bridges um, and the Louvre. The Louvre sort of discovered that it had a lot of American art, or at least some American art, uh, and there was a, a, a great young curator there who was sort of in charge of the British and American uh, art in the Louvre, and uh, there was a, there's a lot of interest uh, in Paris um, recently about American art, um, and the Louvre wanted to kind of get past, you know, it, get past sort of uh, people thinking that American art was just Edward Hopper, um, and maybe Winslow Homer, uh, and, and maybe Sargent, those are the sort of three. Uh, so we wanted to do things that went all the way back into the 18th century, and we were able to really sort of go into the, it, we were really able to kind of go and plunder the Louvre's storerooms to look at things that would really uh, play well with uh, the work that we had at Crystal Bridges, the work that the Terra Foundation had, and the work that uh, the High Museum in Atlanta had. So that's sort of the, the genesis of this. Um, my talk tonight will focus basically on, on how I sort of conceived of the exhibition and then wrote about it. Um, I am uh, a, a historian who's very much interested in networks, uh, networks of people, so networks. Uh, so a lot of what I'll be focusing on is relationships between various people in France, Britain, and America, um, artists, but also <laughs> statesmen and, uh, and, and military men, uh, so a number of networks. But I'm also interested in how objects themselves kind of act as nodes to connect people and also to connect kind of ideas, uh, and objects are things that can move like people to and fro, so uh, from uh, one country to another, and they, they may change in meaning, but they're sort of a, uh, I'm interested in how objects kind of emanate a sort of um, a presence and kind of a really sort of um, help people kind of understand uh, and make sense of their world and, and the things that are in it. Uh, so that's what I'll be uh, f focusing on. There's some sort of dense, probably not to many people in this room, but there, there are some kind of dense portions of the talk where there's a lot of kind of names uh, of, of historical figures. But I sort of, uh, that was, that's purposeful uh, in a way because I wanted to sort of really uh, speak to how dense these networks of people were. So, um, so, it, it, so in a way there, there, there's, a, if there's some density here. Plus I, this is a talk that, I, that was based on what I did at the Louvre um, and the French people really like dense intellectual histories. Uh, so I thought that I would give it to them. Uh, so that was also, uh, so that's, that's, that's there. So, um, And I'm sorry for the little, I, like I work on a Mac and whatever, I don't know why they're all tens. They were little, just little dots, but um, so I'm sorry for that, it looks weird. Uh, yeah, on the, uh, many of the artists who created portraits of military and political leaders in Britain and North America, uh, Britain and its North American colonies at the time of the American Revolution operated within complex, overlapping artistic, social, and political networks that extended across the Atlantic Ocean touching Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Edinburgh, London, and Paris. Artists from North America often shared a common teacher in uh, the American-born Benjamin West and had experienced the London art world and its institutions at the turn of the 19th century. During and after the revolution, George Washington became a favored subject of numerous artists, but there often exist multiple versions and copies of portraits of numerous figures aside from Washington. Um, both men and women uh, who were connected to the American Revolution and its fallout in Britain and France. 
Considering the commercial and political links at times frayed by war and revolution that existed between Britain and its former colony in North America and France, it is only fitting that culture and art flowed to and fro on Atlantic currents. I'll be focusing on just a few of the artists involved in transatlantic image making, Benjamin West, Charles Wilson Peale, Gilbert Stewart, Joshua Reynolds, and Henry Rayburn among them, underscoring the stylistic and cultural links between them. Charles Wilson Peale, who you see there on the top left, uh, his son Rembrandt, who you see on the far top right, uh, and Gilbert Stewart, who you see in the center, uh, studied with Philadelphia-born uh, Benjamin West, who had become historical painter to King George III. West instructed three generations of North American artists in his studio, most of whom returned to the United States to become the nation's first generations of, of professional artists. And then you see West's self-portrait at the bottom there, one of his self-portraits. Gilbert Stewart, who lived a peripatetic life, uh, to, to put it mildly, um, had early lessons from a Scottish painter when he was, uh, I think he was fleeing debt, so he went to Scotland. Um, uh, he was, received early lessons from Scottish painter Cosmo Alexander, um, and he traveled to Edinburgh from approximately 1771 to 1773, just as Henry Rayburn, and uh, we see Rayburn's on the right, uh, was beginning his artistic training. Stuart and Rayburn created similar portraits of Scottish men skating, uh, and is that coincidence? I'll talk about it a little bit, maybe, who knows? Uh, although it's not certain that Rayburn had seen Stuart's painting, uh, the two artists demonstrate shared artistic motives and influences that are grounded in uh, particular aspects of Scottish culture and British painting. Rayburn could have learned of Stuart's painting of William Grant skating on the Serpentine, uh, after it was the one on the left, after it was exhibited to acclaim at the Royal Academy, an institution for which Benjamin West, West's always kind of in the background, Stuart's teacher uh, served as, as president. Uh, indeed, Stuart's, Rayburn's, and the Peel's, the Charles and Rembrandt, Peel's portraits share a common heritage in British Grand Manor portraiture as practiced by Alan Ramsey, Joshua Reynolds, Thomas Gainsborough, and West himself. Although West, as we'll see, really did prefer, as many of you know, historical and religious subjects. He didn't like to do portraits and in fact farm them out to Gilbert Stuart whenever he could. Stuart, of course, didn't have the patience for, his, for history painting, so it was, it was a really good symbiotic kind of uh, thing that was going on there. Uh, so now we've got the, the, the Constable Hamilton portrait, the great Gilbert Stuart from about 1797. We're not quite sure. Alexander Hamilton uh, owned that painting. Uh, we've got Gilbert Stuart's uh, portrait of Hugh Percy, the second Earl of Northumberland, uh, which is from the High Museum, uh, and then Rayburn's uh, Lieutenant Robert Hay of Spot, which is the Louvre, um, and I think had never been out on view before we, we exhibited it there, and then it came over uh, to the Crystal Bridges and the High. Um, they, they don't have a love of British painting at the Louvre um, as my, uh, for, for reasons that I think everyone can kind of guess. Um, <laughs> just as artists are connected through training, family, and common visual influences, the subjects of their portraits are, all, are also linked, predominantly through politics and war. Rayburn painted Robert Hay of Spot to commemorate his service as an officer in the British military during years of conflict between Britain, France, and the American colonies. Hugh Percy, second Duke of Northumberland, became an important patron of Stuart when he returned to England. Stuart returned to, when, when, sorry, when Percy returned to England in 1777 after leading British forces against Washington during the American Revolution. Washington's own celebrity during and after the Revolution prompted portraits of him by numerous artists, but most famously Charles Wilson Peale, his son Rembrandt, who we'll see later, and Stuart, some of which found their way to Europe, particularly to France, as diplomatic gifts. This is what I was sort of talking about, is these, these paintings are moving back and forth, um, and, and there's a gift exchange, but there's also this really interesting way that these become kind of talismans of, of, of friendship and of, of political um, um, amity, in a way. Um, Aristocratic members of the French military, including uh, the Comte de Rochambeau and uh, the Marquis de Chastelieu, who had fought with Washington, 
um, also transported replicas of Peel's Washington portraits to their home country in celebration of the alliance between uh, America and France. A full-length portrait of, uh, that you see on the far left uh, of Washington by Peel, now at Versailles. Uh, and during the course of the ex exhibition, we did a lot of research. They thought that, uh, that, the, that was probably a copy um, but the work that I did with the French curator uh, across uh, me working in, in Bretonville and he working in Paris, um, we think that that's probably actually a, a one of a lost co the original by Peel. Um, and it has this really interesting history uh, that really kind of almost sums up what I'm going to be talking about um, in terms of these relationships that sometimes are strained. Uh, we believe that this portrait was commissioned for the Royalist, uh, the Royalist, uh, um, uh, the Chrétien Guillaume de Lamignon Marchermaise. Uh, like, believe me, the French, when I gave this at the Louvre, they, they were really, I, I, they were not happy with my pronunciation, I don't think. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so Marchermaise, he was the, uh, he, he was in, in favor of the, of the American Revolution. Um, but he also worked for the, for, uh, the, the king of France, um, and because of that, he lost his head um, during the terror. Uh, and this painting then comes down to us uh, through really gruesome kind of uh, history, uh, ends up at Versailles, which is kind of ironic in itself, uh, and then kind of the provenance is lost. So uh, by doing a lot of stylistic analysis, we, we and, and, uh, and, 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 um, and technique, and looking at the technique and looking at the conservation and looking sort of really closely at it uh, with a number of, 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 of means through black lighting and all this kind of thing, uh, we were really able, to, we really think this is a, a direct replica of the, the one that's at the F uh, Philadelphia Academy, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. The exchange of portraits between America and France went both ways. The Continental Congress requested paintings of King Louis XVI and Qu Queen Marie Antoinette uh, for their chambers at Independence Hall. You can imagine that, that, you know, that, that, they're, that these, these, the first sort of Senate is meeting under, under the ki a king and queen who are reviled by their own subjects. Uh, 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 where they were, and the works were intended to hang with uh, the portrait of Washington, uh, the, other ver uh, the Peel's original version of that painting uh, that's on the left there, um, and another painting. Um, British aristocrats... Um, who supported the American cause also received the, the, the George Washington's likeness, uh, most notably the portrait commissioned by American uh, politician William Bingham uh, for the Marquis de Lansdowne um, as a token of appreciation. So that's on the far right. So you have people in Britain who, again, are, are, are combatants with the, uh, with the colonists who are still requesting images of Washington because Washington was so uh, meaningful as a kind of hero um, to people. Portraits had their genesis in sort of in, in, in politics and war, but sometimes they were destroyed in war as well. Um, the Marquis de Chastelieu wrote of admiring Peel's portraits, uh, portrait of Washington in Independence Hall. He writes a, a really a very a, a long and kind of um, uh, a, a beautiful appreciation of that portrait as it's hanging in, in Philadelphia. Um, but the painting was attacked by, by Americans in the, the, this, the, the original painting was actually attacked, and it was almost destroyed. It wasn't quite, it was slashed up, and it was returned to Charles Wilson Peel, and it never uh, again kind of graced at any uh, official public building, uh, which is probably why it actually still, still survives. Um, the portraits that Congress commissioned, um, which were replicas by uh, Calais of Louis XVI, so that they, that, that's, that's, that's exactly what it would have looked like, um, are, lost and are, are presumed to be destroyed. Uh, we don't know when that happened, but uh, we, we're guessing. Um, the Marquis de Chastelieu related in journals that he kept during his time in America that British soldiers actually um, carried off to try to protect images of paintings of King George III. Um, installed in particularly, uh, Chastelieu talked about one that was at the chapel at Princeton University um, because they were afraid that the American troops would, would destroy it. Um, and Chastelieu related, the, and this is a sort of great quote, uh, 
uh, a loss for which the Americans easily consoled themselves when the British took the portrait away, declaring that they would have no king among them, not even a painted one. <laughs> what's interesting, and these are just uh, two examples from Williams, um, what's interesting is that, that, that these kind of relationships and networks of associations that move back and forth across the Atlantic, you can really see them in, in portraits of sort of ordinary people. Uh, so that's a John Smybert of, uh, of Sarah Lyde, um, which we just acquired last uh, two years ago. Um, and then on the right is uh, a painting uh, by uh, Francis Coates who, of uh, General Lloyd. Um, the painting of Sarah Lyde is a painting that, that so she married into, her family was very prominent. Um, she was the daughter of a Massachusetts governor um, who owns most of the sort of middle section of Massachusetts. Uh, and, um, she, and she married into a similarly prominent family. Um, during the revolution, they were loyalists and they had to flee. Uh, so she had died by this time, um, but the way that we've reconstructed the provenance, the painting was um, taken by her husband who was still alive at that point. Uh, the uh, widower and her, a couple of, a few of her sons, and they fled with the retreating British army up to Nova Scotia, where they were to then um, uh, disembark and go back to London. Um, her husband, Byfield, dies uh, in Nova Scotia and, and can't go back because uh, he's dead. Um, but his sons, uh, his, his, his sons do manage to go back, and it's, it's the it's our, our, the reconstruction of the provenance that we have. This painting was carried back with them, so it shows up in London um, in the 19th century. And uh, it's then kind of repatriated um, and is, is, has then found its way back to Massachusetts. It was in a Chicago collection and then now it's back to, so it's a sort of, it's nice. We also think that, um, uh, um, so what started off as a kind of, you know, it's probably a marriage portrait or a portrait of her right before she got married becomes this kind of token of remembrance by her, her, her sons uh, who were banished from America and can't come back because they're loyalists. They're, they're all of their lands and all of their money is, uh, you know, is confiscated. Um, so it, it, and then uh, it, you know, it makes its way kind of back. We think that it was actually cut into that oval shape. Um, there aren't any other Smyberts that are in an oval shape. There are lots that have spandrels around them, which is a common thing. Uh, and um, so, and I'm very interested in that, the kind of history of objects in that way and why that would have happened. Do they, you know, it, there, you know it's as mundane reasons as potentially there was a frame that fit it, uh, but it may have been damaged. Uh, we just don't know. I haven't had it um, taken off its stretchers and, and really examined yet. Um, general Lloyd was a Welsh uh, uh, a general-ish. I mean, he called himself a general. He was sort of a general. Um, he fought for just about everybody you could fight for in, uh, in, he fought for Austria, he fought for the French, he was, he fought for the Jacobites uh, for a little while, he, uh, he fought for the Prussians, um, and he, he tried to go fight for the, uh, for the Ottoman Empire, but it was too old at that point, and so they, they were like, you can stay. Um, and he fought all, for, he fought for all of these different people while he was probably serving as a British spy. Uh, so it was, you know, so again, a number, even, uh, you know, some people who are much less, uh, less luminaries than Washington are, are like, like this. Um, and it really is, the, the other thing that really sort of, the Smybert, um, I think is interesting because, you know, we were importing our portrait painters. So Smybert was a British born, obviously, and, and uh, was, was the first kind of great portrait painter in America. Um, but Britain had imported its portrait painters too, all the way back um, to Holbein and then through, um, uh, uh, through Anthony Van Dyke and all the way down. So this idea of, of portrait painters coming from abroad and working for you is also something that kind of relates to this idea of people, of, of travel and of, um, of representations by people, by other people from sort of different cultures and backgrounds and training. It's sometimes dizzying, the cross-pollination, uh, translation and transportation of images and ideologies. Uh, um, that, that, again, might be expected in portraits of aristocrats, but then kind of trickles down to portraits of, uh, of sort of not quite average people, but uh, people who are not, again, quite as prominent. Coates actually wrote a book that was then influential on Washington's own kind of military, uh, uh, his strategies as a general. So he also, as, as much as he learned a lot fighting for all those different people. 
uh, and, and then was, he wrote a very influential uh, manual on, on, on military maneuvers. In the 18th century, and I think this is another good sort of example of that, portrait paintings and painted portraits and portrait painters suffused Britain. The increased market for portraits was driven in part by a consumer revolution that made luxury goods affordable across the, 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 the mainland and the colonies um, and desirable to a larger segment of society. So you had people who wouldn't have been afford, able to afford portraits are now able to afford them. Um, and the, pos the possession of images of oneself, spouse, extended family, or political figures became part, really part of uh, constructing a social and cultural identity for oneself. Uh, more artists entered the profession um, as the infrastructure for uh, and institutions for the production, display, and consumption of art in England matured, uh, but also because wealth, even among the middle classes, grew, um, stimulating demand. As early as 1769, uh, Joshua Reynolds, the eminent British portrait painter, the kind of father of, uh, of the, you know, really the British school of portrait, um, in his lectures uh, on artistic practice to the Royal Academy, summarized the growth of painting in Britain. There are at this time a greater number of excellent artists than were ever known before at one period in this nation. There is also there's a greater super, there is greater wealth among people to reward the artist. So it's again, it's kind of a symbiotic thing. The artistic aims of portraiture were often contested, uh, just as, as these countries were contesting land and, uh, and, and nationhood. In his third discourse from 1770, uh, these are speeches that Reynolds gave about art, Reynolds argued for the ideal and the imaginative over rendering specific and particular aspects of a, of a sitter. Uh, he, he basically wanted sort of, he wanted to, to get to reduce or even eliminate the kind of particular trappings of a, a time and a place to make these kind of things very timeless. Um, he wanted them to be universal so that they could have been seen by someone, you know, in his mind, 200 years later or 200 years earlier and still kind of made, made sense. Um, he also codified a sort of hierarchy of, of painting where portrait painting is sort of somehow in the middle. It's not the highest level of art which is religious and history painting, it's not the lowest, which is kind of landscape and still life. Um, although he placed portraits sort of, you know, in the middle or lower middle of the hierarchy of painting types, uh, he specified that portraits conform to his prescription for the ideal and the generalized. Um, in his portrait of, uh, of King George III from 1779, uh, he attempted to really strike a balance between what the king looked like and these kind of universal symbols of rulership. Um, he subsumes a lot of, there's not a lot of detail in that painting. It's really, there's a, the, the kind of the chiaroscuro of the light really kind of makes that a, a, a painting that is much more about the king himself. Um, you see that there's a lot of light falling on the king's head and, and shoulders, um, less light, the background is very dark. Um, you see very kind of few or very barely kind of uh, uh, depicted trappings of rule, of symbolic rule, so that the crown is Behind him, sort of cut off, uh, you see the, the, the throne of King Edward is, he's, that he's sitting on, but again, it's in darkness. So he's really focusing on the body of the, of the king, and so locating power in, in a body rather than in these sort of symbolic trappings, which I think is interesting. Um, I love the way that he's sort of casually holding that, the, uh, his, you know, his scepter, basically, which really sort of you know, suggests that it's not this, you know, the scepter isn't where power is, it's in his hand, it's in his ability. Um, to, to, to manipulate and to, uh, it, it's in his sort of character in a way, uh, which I think is good. I also love the way that he's sort of sitting casually, but he takes up so much space in that painting that you, know, you really get the sort of sense um, of, of power. Um, however, King George, like, I think he didn't really like uh, this portrait. Um, so he really had a Alan Ramsey uh, do a lot of uh, the, his, his uh, the official portraits were mostly done by Ramsey. Um, and Ramsey is really focusing on on surface, which I think is very interesting, um, and maybe says a lot about King George, uh, but is, you know, there's, the, it's all about the sort of, it, this is all about the trappings of rulership, the ermine, the robes, the, you see very prominent, you, know, you see the, the, now the crown, you know, is right on the table where, right next to his hand, um, you really see that he's focusing on, on surface and, and symbolic detail rather than, um, than the kind of uh, the universal quality of sort of, of, of character that uh, Reynolds would have prescribed. Um, 
which I think is it's really interesting. And that, um, that kind of tension between surface and depth and idealism and a sort of finite, almost magic realism will play out in the American portrait painters uh, as, as well. Um, the king's pose here, I mean, it, in a way the Ramsey portrait, I feel like is, is sort of a, it's an idealized body standing in a very particular, um, you know, he's got his, his turned out feet. Um, he's, he's displaying a, a complete sort of comportment as you would find it in a manual of comportment from the time, uh, which were really starting to come out and be very popular that would tell you how to stand, how to sit, um, and, you know, how to kind of display your, your body so that you were at once kind of um, seeming in control, but on the other hand, kind of it was a casual, there was a casualness, a studied casualness. Um, there's almost a way in which he takes, maybe, you know, he sort of takes Reynolds' head and he puts it on a kind of just idealized body that really could be anyone's um, in a way, which I think, and so there's a really interesting difference there. Um, and West, who secured royal patronage from George III, um, depicted the monarch in 1779, and as we'll see uh, a little bit later, so West really changed the game in terms of what he was doing and, and really sort of um, w almost went the complete opposite of what Reynolds was doing in that uh, he depicts the king in a very particular military uniform. He depicts a specific event, uh, which is, and you see two other of his commanders behind him on horseback. Um, this was a, uh, a crisis that had happened um, during the, uh, the, the sort of revolutionary wars uh, and uh, where you know, France had become an ally. And so all of a sudden, um, the, the King George found himself fighting on a variety of different fronts. And they were very worried that France might try to invade uh, uh, England. Um, so there was, a, uh, so there was a, a, a huge kind of rush to pull back troops, which, didn't, which, probably, which helped us a lot, um, to guard the coasts. And uh, this, is the, the, this is this event that, um, that, that, that West is, is depicting. Um, but it's a really weird kind of historical event. It's, it's like an administrative victory. Like, oh, I, I, was, I moved troops from one place to another. And it was also a, a, an administrative victory that cost him uh, significantly in, on, in the war in North America and, and likely in Spain as well. Um, so it's almost a Pyrrhic victory. And that sort of speaks to West's uh, potential kind of conflicted loyalties between, uh, between Britain and America. He, was, he, was, you know, he, he expressed, he in, there's inferences that he was very much um, uh, sort of for the American cause, but he certainly would have lost all of his patronage had he um, had he claimed that, and, probably, and you know, he probably would have had to go back, and he would have lost everything that he had. Uh, so he was very coy about uh, his, his, his loyalties. Um, later on in his career, he actually goes to Paris, and um, that actually sort of ends his career, uh, because he comes back, and the royal family is really, that, you know, he's, his painting has seemed to have changed to be very Francophone, and um, he loses, uh, th that's at the point at which he starts losing royal patronage. And it's really the painting on the left that is West's breakthrough painting, where he, this is, a, a, this is a, 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 the death of General Wolfe at the Battle of Quebec uh, in 1770. Um, Reynolds would have dressed all of these guys up in, uh, in, in, in classical robes, um, and he would have made this event kind of a, probably you, know, you would have seen uh, uh, Wolfe kind of floating, you know, there would have been an apotheosis, and um, it would have been all very much kind of in this, in this sort of symbolic language that had developed since the ancient, since classical times revived in the Renaissance and then gone all the way through. Um, but he makes them very uh, sort of present in, in, the, the, in the costumes that they would have worn. Every one of these is a portrait head. He tried to find everyone that was at that battle and saw the death of uh, Wolf, and he uh, then um, uh, painted them. Um, he does add some elements that you know you're in the Americas, so there's, a, there's sort of a guide on the far left, and there's a Native American figure um, as sort of these symbolic references, and it certainly references, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, deposition scenes. Certainly there's an idea that he's adding some of that kind of symbolic religious uh, angle back into it, uh, but it's not obvious. Um, the um, painting on the right, also from Williams, um, shows, and I love the, these two ju the juxtaposition here because West kind of makes his name with, with this painting, and it's, a, it's sort of revelatory, uh, but he really wants to paint these religious paintings, and he um, really sort of helps invent the language of Romanticism uh, 
um, by, uh, by sort of invoking the sublime in these religious subjects. Um, it's sort of terrible sublime, uh, sort of a deluge. So better uh, example of West. So West trains Charles Wilson Peel, another uh, a, a, a Philadelphian um, who goes to study with West. Um, and this is one of Charles Wilson Peel's kind of first commissioned portraits. And oh boy, does that look like a Reynolds. Um, so although he's training with West, he's really sort of, uh, you know, he is, um, is subscribing to Joshua Reynolds's kind of um, suggestion that you really need to make things kind of timeless by using the kind of visual language um, of the classical world in particular. Um, so uh, Pitt is a statesman um, who is very much in support of the American cause and in fact gives a very famous speech uh, supporting the Americans on the floor of parliament. Uh, and uh, the, there are a number of West Virginians who want Peel to commemorate that uh, uh, by painting his portrait. So Peel does it. Um, there, it's, there are two versions of it. It was also made into a print. Um, it's in the West Moreland County Museum in, in Virginia. It's, I have not seen it. It's, I, I don't know. It's, it, it, it was very hard to get an image of it um, even. Um, but it has this kind of, again, it's a very much a kind of order pose. It looks very Roman, uh, which would have been great visual language. And in fact, is obviously the visual language of early America, uh, United States. Um, he's pointing back to the place where, uh, um, uh, where King Charles lost his head. So there's a real kind of um, really walking a fine line between kind of treasonous uh, behavior at this point, which is interesting. Um, Peel was always political. So unlike West, who had to really walk a fine line and really could not be obviously political, uh, Peel can be. So, um, and in fact, there's stories of him that he would, you know, King George would pass by and he wouldn't take off his hat uh, because he didn't respect that. So. Um, these, the, so this is, it's a nice kind of contrast um, it, because Peel will, when he comes back, do these, these paintings that look very much um, like a cross between what West is doing and what Ramsey is doing, focusing on a lot of surface, um, but, uh, but making things, but he, he stops the practice of, um, you know, of making uh, people like Washington in, in classical robes um, that, that's left for sculpture. So now we're back in Scotland with our two skaters. I'm going off script, so I'll just hold on a second. Um, so, and we're back to, we're back with Gilbert Stewart now, and we'll, we'll stay a little bit more with Stewart and, and to a certain extent Peel for the rest of the talk. So Stewart left uh, West Studio. I talked a little bit earlier about how they kind of, what he would, West would take uh, West was just sort of naturally, or sorry, Stuart was kind of naturally gifted um, and was able to paint in this very kind of Gainsborough-esque style, a very sort of impressionistic uh, style and became very popular very quickly. Um, and West was fine with that and he, they split the business to a certain extent. Um, Stuart left West's studio though to become a fully independent portrait painter in about 1782, right after he exhibits this painting um, to a, an incredible acclaim. Uh, it depicts uh, a lawyer uh, skating on the Serpentine, which is an artificial lake um, in London's Hyde Park. Uh, he sent it to the Royal Academy, where critics favorably compared it to full-length full -length portraits by Gainsborough. Um, Stuart, they both, Stuart and Gainsborough both have this kind of frothy brushwork. My time at the Huntington acquainted me a lot with Gainsborough, uh, so, I, so I really was able to come to compare them. And you really do see this, there's a, such a graceful and easy way um, that Stuart and Gainsborough, and then you know, people like Sargent paint in, that um, is sort of it's incredible to behold when you can get close up to the great ones. Um, there's also, a, the, we're, we're getting away from that kind of chiaroscuro, so the Baroque kind of quality of some of the earlier paintings that we saw of, uh, by Reynolds in particular, um, but also by West is, is sort of fading. So we, we're starting to see uh, Emphasis, and it's a really, you see it in sort of the, the, the kind of Scottish school of philosophy, so Hume um, and, uh, and, and, and the others. Um, uh, you're starting to see an, em an emphasis on A, empiricism, so like depicting act things that you actually see, um, and B, personal character, and that you know, how it really all comes down to 
the ideas of character and sort of moderation. Um, and, and what we're really seeing here um, are, are two kind of facets of that. So, uh, you know, so both men are, you know, the backgrounds are very plain. Um, we're really sort of seeing a shift in, uh, in culture and in the depiction of, of people in culture and society um, to really uh, emphasize, um, I like to say about these, both of these men are really self-propelled. They're sort of, they're, they're, it's, it's, there's something that's driving them from inside again rather than uh, from outside. Um, they're skating in two different ways. Um, uh, uh, Grant is kind of making these really elegant kind of um, uh, uh, figures on, uh, figure eights probably on the serpentine and you can kind of see the really graceful and light way that he's kind of stepping and there's, you can see the, the tracks there that he's making. Um, Rayburn is, de is depicting a, uh, a, the, the, um, a, a reverend, a skating reverend, um, who's going fast. He's speed skating, basically. And you can see that also in uh, the tracings left by his skates. Um, and skating in particular, and this is Grant, Grant and, and, uh, um, and the skating reverend, um, are both Scottish. And, and skating was particularly associated with Scotland. Um, so there's a really great way in which these are both connected through, uh, through culture. Um, as well as through, uh, through subject. Uh, Grant sends Stuart's painting back to the Royal Academy um, much later, so the, in 1878, so you know, 100 century later, um, and no one knew that it was by Stuart. Uh, um, and first they thought it was by Gainsborough, um, and then they thought that potentially it was by Rayburn. So there's a way in which Rayburn is really kind of adopting that light brushwork as well. He's not quite as good at it, uh, but he's close in his great paintings. Um, he's very good. Um, and Rayburn, as I mentioned at the outset, did overlap with Stuart uh, at, uh, and could have really seen that painting um, or at least it, experienced it. He was also very close to, um, uh, Rayburn was also very close to where um, the, the painting from the Louvre spot, or uh, um, uh, Robert Hay of spot lived um, as, as well. There's a, there's a sort of, yeah, I like the phrase kind of, there's a sensibility and self-command about these two figures um, that I think has a lot to do with um, a sort of shift from a kind of, um, a, a kind of neoclassical mentality to um, something more akin to sort of romantic um, conception of the individual um, and subjectivity uh, in a way. Rayburn did a series of portraits of hereditary chieftains in full Highland dress, uh, including the, uh, uh, what you see on the left there, Colonel Alistair uh, McDonnell of Glengarry. Um, and what he's really doing there is portraying a Scottish elite that's seeking to reestablish traditional clan alliances uh, and their leadership roles by embracing outmoded dress. The, the British had had outlawed tartan, and, and they really didn't know, I mean, no one wore it, and they didn't really know what, you know, that they were starting, they, they wanted, they knew that it was Highland, and they knew that it was, that it was Scottish, um, and they knew that, you know, sort of back in like the, you know, that it was important sort of in the, in the Braveheart days, uh, but, um, you know, they were really all of these sort of family tartans, they were all making those up, I mean, there wasn't, they didn't really have that knowledge um, passed down. Um, so they are, they're sort of reclaiming that, um, uh, the Jacobites, basically, the, after the Jacobite revolutions in the 1740s, uh, 30s and 40s, they, it was really outlawed. Um, it was lifted in 1789, so people like McDonnell, who were elites, are trying to kind of reclaim the idea that they're, they're these clan leaders, in a way. Um, and, they're, and they're using tartan as a kind of symbol of that. Um, the, these men wore these, this highland dress in, when they fought in, uh, in British regiments. Um, in the Napoleonic Wars uh, in particular. Um, and again, it was a way of kind of establishing a military clan kind of identification and authority. Um, not everyone, however, not every Scot, wore or thought that that was a kind of really, it was, it was part of their culture necessarily. So um, uh, Robert Hay is from the, from the Lowlands, um, which is very much more for, uh, uh, culturally connected to, uh, to Britain, and so he's depicted in a kind of re regular red coat, sort of, um, it's, he's an infantryman, and it, it's, that's his, um, he's like the second company of foot or something, and that's what he's, that's the uniform that he's wearing. Um, so you really do see, again, a kind of, even within a country, you see um, similarities, you see people using the same artists uh, 
to depict very kind of different um, uh, uh, you know, cultural or cultural sort of the, the authority in, 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 uh, in this period as well in the sort of la latter days of the 18th century and into the 19th. Peel and Stewart return to North America and they continue to work with the conventions that they had learned in London. Uh, there, many portraits of George Washington circulated throughout the United States. And then, as I mentioned, also back to England, but also just to France, to Spain, to Holland. Um, the Marquis de Chastelieu, who I talked about earlier, he, he, and he fought with Washington, he knew him quite well. Um, he described Washington like this. He said, his, statue, his stature is noble and lofty. He is well made and exactly proportioned. His physiognomy is mild and agreeable, but such as to render it impossible to speak particularly of any of his features, so that in quitting him, you have only the recollection of a fine face. He has neither a grave nor a familiar air. His brow is sometimes marked with thought, but never in quietude. In inspiring respect, he inspires confidence, and his smile is always the smile of benevolence. Chastelieu acquired the painting on the left, um, the half length, as uh, it, that depicts Washington as the commander in chief of. Uh, the Continental Army, and it commemorates their sort of bond together in, in war. Um, Chastelieu and Washington fought at Yorktown, so um, that you see Yorktown behind. Um, so sometimes, usually it's Princeton, but this one um, is, is Yorktown. Um, and it's one of the numerous replicas that uh, Peel painted after his original full length in 1779. Peel first paints Washington in 1772 to commemorate his military service, um, but then he and, and Peel joins up. So Peel actually, like Chastelieu, fights with Washington um, and has the opportunity to kind of see him in person and, and know him. He's an officer. Um, he and they, uh, he's on the third, Peel's on the third boat to, 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 um, uh, to, to cross the, um, cross into New Jersey on in January um, 1777, and he fights with him in, at, at Princeton. Um, and he actually fights and he sees action. Um, uh, he's ordered by Washington's troops to guard a road and the, the British, uh, the, the Hessians come um, and to attack and so they drive them back. Um, so he actually really does have this experience as a soldier fighting with, with Washington. Um, so he really could boast that qualification that Peel fought with Washington. Um, so you, you have to think that, that you know, Gilbert Stewart is painting Washington, Peel is painting Washington, a number of other people are painting Washington. So the idea of whose portrait is the most authoritative um, does kind of come up as, as an issue. Um, and if you could say, well, you know, I, I, you know Stuart was, who knows where he was? Um, probably drunk or gambling or something. Um, uh, but what's interesting about Peel's portrait, and you can see that when comparing it with Alan Ramsey's, is Peel's just, he's, he's using the conventions and the kind of the, the idea of surface and of kind of iconography and, and symbols as being uh, as important as potentially a realism in, in the portrait uh, to depict Washington. I mean, this is he's copying almost sort of uh, the pose, almost exactly the pose of Ramsey's portrait. Um, and he really, like Ramsey, is concentrating on, you know, you see that the silk of his sash, you know, the, 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 the glint of the buttons, um, you know, the bronze of the cannon, all of those things are really rendered in this very precise, uh, you know, kind of he's getting the texture, he's showing you the, the captured flags of the Hessians. Um, and again, it's, it's more about sort of symbol rather than, uh, than, than person to, to a certain extent. I talked about the, 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 uh, the, this Peel portrait being slashed by Americans. Um, and it's probably because the portraits looked the, the, the Peel's original portrait looked too much like a state portrait of a royal uh, uh, ruler. And unlike Gilbert Stewart's, who we're going to see, uh, which concentrate more on, 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 on Washington as a person, um, the, this looks too much like, you know, when they're not going to have kings, this looks like Washington is potentially a king. Um, so it's an interesting, so it probably was good that it stayed in his studio rather than, um, than go to uh, back to Independence Hall where it might have been, uh, been permanently destroyed like the others of King Louis XVI and the Queen. 
the Constable Hamilton portrait by Stuart is juxtaposed with another Gilbert Stuart of, of, of Hugh uh, Percy. Um, what's, what I love about these two portraits is that, so Hugh Percy was fought against Washington very early on. Um, and in fact, Hugh, he's, he's sort of, he, Percy supports to a certain extent the kind of colonists' right to self-rule. Um, he's sort of on their side. You know, he's a representative of the British government, uh, but he, he's on the side of, of that. However, at Lex, after Lexington and Concord, he's, you know, he's, he basically says, well, how, how audacious. I, you know, they're, they're firing on our troops. And he then goes after Washington with a vengeance um, and beats him back in, in some of the first uh, battles of the Revolutionary War, American Revolution. Um, and he then, however, is has a, not a change of heart, but really, you know, is, he's conflicted, Percy is conflicted. Uh, and he disagrees with William Howe, the, the, the leader of British forces in America. And he's, he's sort of, he, he's sent back to uh, England. Um, and that's where he meets Gilbert Stuart. And Stuart, and he, uh, he paints a number of, uh, of portraits of, um, of, of, of Percy's family, um, which is, is great. Stuart, Returns, although uh, we were talking a little bit earlier that that the uh, that that John Jay maybe suggested um, that Washington meets Stuart. The the um, the story that Stuart always told was that um, that he 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 knew that Washington portraits were going to be a kind of gold mine, and he came back from London specifically for that reason. He creates three uh, versions of them, all slightly different. So the Vaughan is the earliest. Um, it's looked at, I think, by, both at, by Stuart and by Washington as sort of unsuccessful. Um, there's a sort of stiffness about Washington, um, and uh, you know, it, he had probably different dentures at that point. Um, at, you know, he, and you know, both Stuart and, and Washington talk about that. You know, it was very much kind of, it, you know, it, was, he, it would change the shape of his face. Um, and there's something that's a little bit, um, uh, it, uh, St Washington was also, according to, to Stuart, um, and unlike, you know, Chasselieu talks about this kind of very benevolent, very kind of moderate person. Um, and, and Stewart, uh, by contrast, says that, you know, Washington is fierce and he, you know, he's worried that Washington is just like has all of this kind of anger and like and, and sort of passion in him that you never know like what's going to come out and, you know, when he's going to strike in a way. So you could, you, you almost have these really diametrically opposed uh, ideas about Washington as a person by two people who knew him. Um, uh, the first, uh, Stuart also talks about how hard it was to get Washington to kind of open up. He didn't really want necessarily, uh, you know, all these people were taking his portrait and he was, you know, but um, supposedly Stuart started talking about horses and Washington, as most of us know, was a really great horseman. Uh, and uh, so he, uh, and apparently that, that gave, opened him up a little bit. So you, in the second portrait, the Athenaeum type portrait, which all of these are, are, uh, are, are named by their provenance. So Vaughan was commissioned by a Vaughan. The Athenaeum was acquired by the Boston Athenaeum. Um, and then the Lansdowne, as I mentioned, was commissioned by the Marquis de Lansdowne. Um, the, so the, 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 the Athenaeum portrait, which is not finished, uh, is the one that we know m m best because it's on, it's the, it's the basis for the $1 bill uh, portrait. Um, it's unfinished because uh, Washington lent it back to Stuart so that Stuart could make copies of it. Uh, because there was just a huge demand, and Washington you know, knew that Stuart, would, you know, this is, was going to be the way that he was going to earn his livelihood. Uh, he made about 150 of these copies um, at, you know, at between 50 and 100 dollars a piece, and that was good money. And you know, right around in the first couple, uh, in the last decade of the 18th and first couple decades of the 19th centuries. Um, and Martha Washington was only able to get them back on as on. Actually, you know, she never got them back. Um, uh, and so they were really, really never went back. They never went to the Washingtons, uh, interestingly enough. Um, and the Lansdowne is the, mo is the closest to a kind of a state portrait, um, to sort of the closest to a portrait like what Peel was doing. However, um, I think, that, and you see classical pose, but um, you know, he's dressed not as a kind of, not in the trappings of rule, but he's in a very, very simple black suit. Um, he's not a military leader here. He's really doing the business of governing. Um, so there is, I think, a real difference between those portraits. And, and uh, even though they have a lot of the same kind of symbolic language, uh, but this one more successful in a big way because of that. And also, interestingly, most people wanted the Athenaeum type. They, most people wanted his head, not the other, um, not any of the kind of trappings. 
Um, so the Constable Hamilton portrait is based on the Lansdowne, but he's seated, Washington is seated there, um, and, but he's wearing the same kind of costume. He has a sword. Uh, it's not in use, but he has it, so the, the, the sort of power, military power is there. Um, we think, and this was owned by Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, uh, and we, we think that this was really related to the Jay Treaty, and related to the Jay Treaty for a number of, of reasons. Um, that are all kind of that come out in 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 what's what in what he's holding, what's behind him. So behind him are are ships that are fighting, um, and you know, all of you sure know about more about the JTG probably than I do. But um, you know after the cessation of hostilities on the grounds between Britain and America, there was still this idea that Britain felt like it could commandeer American ships. They they really didn't work that out. Um, was that Jay's fault, so that's the, uh, the Treaty of Paris? Um, and so there was a, so, so a lot of ships were taken, a lot of uh, Americans were kind of pressed into British uh, Navy, um, and it was really kind of an untenable situation on the high seas, um, and that really needed to be sort of solved. So, um, so, so Jay is sent over and negotiates this, um, uh, and it's really controversial, and it's controversial for a number of reasons, but most of the reasons that I in, in talk, like talking about are what was happening, it was happening in secret. So one of the things that a lot of prominent Americans, first generation of kind of, a, of United States citizens, wanted out of their government was transparency. And a lot of government was done in the open. People could go see what, this, what Congress was doing. This, the, the, the sort of deliberations over this treaty were done in secret, and there is a there was a, there's a sort of whole culture um, where if you look at lots of different kinds of writing from this time, it's you know the the most hated thing is deception and sort of you know and and sort of it, there's a huge fear that people are kind of pulling the wool over each other's eyes. There's a huge kind of idea that about authenticity and about transparency, um, and the J Treaty is 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 one of these is is a thing that is being negotiated in in secret. Um, what, and Gilbert Stewart is a kind of prankster. There are a number of paintings that have really sort of interesting kind of pun, visual puns in them. Um, and so what I love about this portrait is, so you see Washington is holding a document. Um, and if that is the, the treaty, uh, or representation of the treaty that he has potentially signed or is going to sign, um, that kind of brings the idea of the treaty symbolically through this image out into the open. Uh, and it kind of, it, it sort of mitigates this idea that this is happening in secret. However, Stuart, it's, a, it's just a sort of blurred mess that you cannot read anything except Washington's name. Um, so at one hand, he's revealing this treaty, but he's also keeping it secret. Um, and I, I love that, the sort of the idea that um, Stuart had the kind of both the knowledge, the sophistication to, to know what was really happening um, and why people were sort of upset at the progress of the treaty. Um, deliberations, but then also that he sort of he he, he hides it from from people, um, so he's revealing yet concealing, which I think is a really um, a really great great thing. The I just saw the beautiful Trumbull. Trumbull is a whole other kind of story, and and and, and is a is a great sort of talk uh, unto himself. Um, and this is probably the most one of the most successful renderings uh, portrait renderings by Trumbull that I've seen. Um, you know, Trumbull tried to make his fortune on, on, and you have prints of them out in the hall on these grand kind of West-like scenes of battle. However, um, you know, there was just not a market for those necessarily. Um, and I think Trumbull is much better when he's restrained and doesn't actually um, try to kind of do complicated um, compositions. Um, and so here you really, and again, you have a very Stuart-like concentration on the, 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 on the face and on the idea of this as a man and, and not sort of you know, surrounded by kind of empty symbols of, of one thing or another. Trumbull, like, you know, like Coates, um, a lot of people know this, but um, you know, Trumbull was, was both a painter who studied with West. Um, he was from a prominent fam kinetic family um, and, and probably acted both as a diplomat and probably a spy uh, for the Americans. And maybe a, a, a friend of mine wrote a dissertation arguing that he was like a double agent. 
Um, so it was, it, so anyway, Trumbull and himself um, speaks to all of these kind of, of relationships. Uh, before I end, I'll show you two images of one, the first portrait, uh, one of the first portraits by Washington um, of, the, of a, a, a marquise who um, came to visit. Um, and it's a really beautiful little cameo. It, it, it looks like it's carved, it's not, it's actually on ivory. Um, and uh, th this was a, the, 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 the French diplomats who had come um, and they, they became very close with Washington. Um, and, uh, and, um, and she wanted to have something to carry back with her. So she did this really lovely portrait, again, in a kind of very Reynolds-like style, very classical. Um, and then Copley, um, a really great portrait that's a Terra Foundation, um, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, um, uh, Judith Murray, um, who was someone who was writing a lot about women's role in the revolution and how after the American Revolution, the kind of the life of women should change and that there, all of this revolutionary change should, you know, women should be educated and women should, um, should, should really be equal partners. And you saw this in France a little bit later as well, but um, that didn't work out so well, but she was publishing these tracks and she was a really important printer who was publishing a lot of pamphlets that, um, that were, um, were important in kind of establishing um, the ideas of governance and the ideas of the ideas and ideals of the United States. The kind of uh, the legacy of the of Washington and of the founding fathers and of these networks um, it, it comes to sort of fruition or it comes to the end in in the sort of Jacksonian period. Uh, so Rembrandt Peale, son of Charles Wilson, is doing these porthole images. These are done in the eight, first in about 1825. Um, when there's a real sense that the, for that generation of founding fathers is, has, is passed. Um, and there's this worry that without those men, America is, you know, maybe has, is losing its way to a certain extent. Um, so there's a huge uh, influx, or there's a, a, there's a resurgence in paintings of the founding fathers. So um, Rembrandt, Washington sat for Rembrandt, uh, one of the last um, uh, living um, uh, the last times that, that uh, Washington sat for anyone was for Rembrandt. Um, but he makes this into an amalgamation of it's part Stuart, it's part his father, and it's part Rembrandt's own rendering um, when Washington was sitting for him. Um, so it's a really generalized and it's a very idealized Washington. He's set behind this portal, uh, which you know, it, it separates the kind of living from the dead. Um, and, and it also suggests the kind of this idea of removal that um, that we're, we are perhaps maybe too removed um, from, uh, from, from that generation. Um, you also see that sort of uh, coming out in um, genre paintings from, from this time. So this is R Richard Catton Woodville's War News from Mexico, the uh, Mexican War. Um, and um, this is a very participatory kind of democracy, uh, but it's also a troubling one. Uh, we have uh, women and, uh, and, and African Americans who are, are literally sort of outside of the, they're off the porch, they're not part of the debate. Um, you have a variety of different kind of types of Americans, including um, a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, and you sort of, so, and, and you're, there's this idea that, um, as there's, there, that, that democracy is somewhat dangerous. And uh, there's a real sense um, in the 1820s through the 50s um, that, there's, that there's a sense of kind of loss um, and that there's a sense of kind of rebuilding again. Um, so just as I started talking about these images that were done during the American Revolution um, and then subsequently as people were trying to kind of figure out a visual language for the United States, I'll end with, uh, with a time after the sort of a second attempt um, at making a visual language uh, for America as it sort of matured into the 19th century. Um, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, there was, 
the, the one uh, really great um, example of that is, is a painter named Ralph Earl, who's uh, a Connecticut-based painter normally. Um, he's actually jailed uh, by the British uh, as a spy uh, when he's studying with West because he had gone, you know, he'd just come and um, there was a sense that, you know, maybe he wasn't, it was a good cover for all these Americans to come study with West, right? But what were they really doing? Um, also, Ralph Earl wasn't as good as some of these other artists, so maybe they thought, well, he's not as talented, so he must be a spy because he's not there learning painting. Um, but yeah, so, so sometimes they actually were. Um, Trumpel, I think, was also detained for a while, uh, uh, if I'm remembering that right. So yes, and sometimes they, they were. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a remarkable history to have you know, sort of Stuart painting both sides and, and West is kind of painting both sides. Uh, so it really does show you how close, I mean, these people were so close on so many other things, and they were, you know, they were related, and they had had the same training, and they had the same background. Um, and as as Melissa said, they were really sort of, you know, are they British? Are they American? How do you, you know? How do you know? And um, so they were so close in some ways, and so so opposed in others. That makes this time period, and and you see it in the art, um, really exciting uh, to to sort of to think about and to kind of look at and study. West American Peace Commissioners with the blank side of the canvas mm -hmm. where presumably the British Peace Commissioners the British, would be right. there. What's your version of the story of why it's unfinished? That's a good question. I mean, there are, there are a couple of other Wests that are sort of like that. Um, and there are a lot of paintings that are unfinished for... West had, you know, West had a little bit of a troubled history. I mean, in, in, you know, he was, yeah, at one hand, you know, he was the, the historical portrait painter to the king, but that didn't necessarily mean that all of his, his paintings and all of his commissions were ever were going to be kind of completed. Um, and you know, West kind of ends up as a really frustrated painter because he, you know, he wants to do these big uh, religious and history paintings, he, 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 and he runs at that, at the point at which he's most successful, he runs afoul of King George. Uh, and you know who is who's kind of who's who's starting to kind of um, be less there as a person um, and a little bit more moody and sort of so. Um, but yeah, I I, I, um, I don't have a, a good re answer for that. Um, I wish I I looked it up uh, before I got here. Yeah. No. They're really not. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Stuart was at his height of his powers, so right around 1800. Um, but he lives until about 1820 something, 1822 maybe. Uh, and he churns these out. And as you get further into the, the, the 19th century, you start to see very qualitative differences. Now, on one hand, that's um, you know, that's St Stuart getting older. But on the other hand, it's you know. It, he had the original painting, but he's making a copy. All uh, you know, he's making copies of you know of a painting that he made a long time. You know, so you know, 20 years ago. So you know, probably he's he's losing a sort of sense of what Washington actually looked like when he was there. Um, and then there are some paintings um, that are potentially sort of that his daughter Jane may have helped him with, um, who was a painter toward the end of his life. So at the Huntington, um, we had a, we had a peel and we had two Athenaeum portraits. One, a spectacular early, very early, 1797 uh, uh, Stuart um, Athenaeum type. And then we had a, Henry Huntington had bought an 1816 one. Uh, and when you hung them together, you really wanted to put the 1816 one somewhere else um, because it just didn't do that, that commission justice. But um, that happened all the time. If, uh, we talked a lot about you know, here, there are lots of copies. Um, and, and family members would, you know, would sometimes have if Stuart painted your family and then you were, you were gonna move somewhere, you would have, call Stuart up and you would have him copy those paintings again. Um, and sometimes the, they're right on, they look almost identical. Sometimes, depending on, you know, did, he, did he have Vanderlyn or one of his students do more work or less work? Uh, sometimes there are real differences, but that's, it's, uh, yeah, so they're not quite all. And you see that if you look at auction records, you, you can kind of, just by going down the numbers, you can tell like, that must be a late one, that must be an early one. Um, yeah. That's right, that's also fair enough. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, they, they certainly stand up with Reynolds and Ramsey, the really great ones. I mean, the one, you know, I was just in Philadelphia and looked at the, the original. It's, it's, it, and, you know, and Peel didn't, Peel had, you know, Peel was a real, as you know, he was a real Renaissance man. So he, painting was one of the things that he did. Um, and then he had, you know, 20 kids and he named them all after painters. Um, Titian, there were two Titians because the first one died young, so, but that's a great name, so you don't want to, you, you know, need to use it again, um, and you know, Rembrandt and Raphael and Rubens and Artemisia and you know, so on and on and on. Uh, and they also, in their own right, um, particularly Rembrandt, um, really inherited, I think, that this, the, 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 the really ability to kind of capture surface in a way that Charles um, did. Um, but, um, and so he, he, his progeny um, were all, a lot of them were artists. But they were, you know, they, they, they founded some of the first museums, uh, kind of half museums, half kind of Barnum, uh, kind of um, uh, sideshow sort of things. Um, they were, had a lot of kind of different things going on, but they were all very committed and very um, uh, you know, committed to the, the, um, the United States as a kind of project. Um, and, and so that comes out in a lot of their, their projects, whether they're paintings or whether they're, um, they're other things. Uh, uh, Titian, the second Titian was uh, on one of the first scientific expeditions uh, that was found, that was supported by the government um, to go into the to sort of the, the West, which was, you know, uh, like sort of Missouri and, you know, at that, that point. Um, so, the, I mean, the Peel family is fascinating in their own kind of right. We're going to have to leave that for another evening. <laughs> so, thank you very sure. much. Um, <laughs> We have books over here. If anyone would like Kevin to sign a book, then that's happening over there. Please stick around and have a glass of wine and keep talking. And thank you all for coming.